Hey folks, welcome to the Mobius Partners Groovers Talk Tech Podcast. My name is Scott King, your podcast host and CTO here at Mobius. Once again, we're on the topic of cybersecurity, a top priority and investment area for all organizations these days. And we have a very special guest joining me. Today's topic, down the rabbit hole, the future of cybersecurity. What does this mean? Uh, well, we're about to break this down for you. Our guest today is Josh, Joshua Brown, Global Chief, Chief Information Security Officer at H&R Block. Joshua, Joshua has a self-proclaimed non-traditional background with 25 years experience working in various different IT support and leadership roles. Welcome, Joshua. Thanks for joining me. And please let our listeners know a little bit more about your background, and then we'll jump in on today's topic. Hey, Scott. Thanks for having me. Yeah, like you said, you know, I didn't come to uh, to technology or cybersecurity in, in a traditional uh, way. Um, I was, uh, uh, you know, I, I was an academic. Um, I was pursuing a PhD in philosophy and ethics, um, you know, before I made the pivot to technology. Um, but I, you know, I think I've always been a technologist at heart. Um, and, you know, when I was in grad school, I worked on the side um, with an initiative at, at Georgetown where we were trying to bring technology into the classroom. And that meant everything from, you know, building a framework for a digital slide library in Cold Fusion to helping a, you know, 90 year old provost learn how to use a mouse for the first time. Um, I cut my teeth uh, at the Motley Fool uh, back before the dot com bust, uh, working, working on, uh, you know, on their on their technology team. Uh, and uh, and then I, I moved to the Omnicom group. I spent 14 years there in various roles uh, supporting technology and kind of finished up as a deputy CISO uh, at their corporate level before I made the switch to H&R Block uh, about four years ago. So, uh, you know, what a long, strange trip it's been, but um, I wouldn't I wouldn't change any of it. Uh, it all, uh, you know, affected me and, and brought me to, to who I am and how I operate today. No, that's awesome for that. It's always interesting to get the different backgrounds of folks. You know, so many uh, coming from uh, uh, you know, different, different uh, how they started, right? You know, I think maybe a topic for another podcast. Kind of, right? it's, it's just yeah, kind of maybe in IT for sure. But but uh, thanks for joining us. Really, uh, really great to get connected with you. And uh, let's get started on the topic today. Um, uh, you know. Give us a little bit of uh, insight and kind of what the landscape is today around cybersecurity. You live this every day with your team, and you know, uh, uh, so 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 maybe maybe kick it off that way. What, what's kind of the current? State? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the current state isn't great. Um, you know, and and just just to be clear, I, when I you know when I speak about these topics, I'm talking about cybersecurity in general. Not this is not specific to H and R Block. Uh, it's not specific to any of the places I've worked. Obviously, those uh, places uh, shape my views uh, and 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 have gotten me to where I am. But um, you know the the good guys have been have been getting our uh, collective rear ends kicked for quite a while. Um, and you know there are there are. Uh, peaks and valleys uh, like anything else. Um, but one of the really interesting things is that the market hasn't really responded in a way that would actually enable the good guys to win. So we see the market respond a lot of times with technology solutions, right? Um, and, and, and people want, they want technology to solve their problems for them. Technology is a, a part of the solution, but it's not the whole thing. Um, you know, in the U.S. alone, there's about 850,000 open cybersecurity positions right now. We simply don't have the mass of talent to be able to provide the services to organizations that they need to provide an effective defense. Um, at the same time, when you think about your, you know, the adversaries, and these don't have to be nation states or organized crime, it, it you know, unfortunately can still be the, the script kiddies out there. Um, but you know, there are, um, they only have to be right once and we have to be right all the time. Um, and our budgets are limited and our, uh, the amount of resources and time we have to put into playing cyber defense uh, are also limited, whereas uh, the adversary is effectively unlimited in those places. So uh, it, it's not a great position to be fighting uh, from. That said, um, there's there's a whole lot of things that are that are, are really in motion that I think you know I, I am optimistic I'm 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 hopeful about the future. Um, 
I think that there's a, a growing recognition that uh, people are the, are the key piece uh, that we've been lacking, that we have to be uh, training the next generation of, of cybersecurity warriors and leaders. And that means that as an industry, we have to take a really hard look at how we recruit, how we mentor, and frankly, um, how we've been gatekeeping, um, requiring things that, um, you know, like, like specific college degrees, right? Um, I didn't have a cybersecurity degree. I had an ethics degree. Um, some of the most successful people I've had in my organizations have been humanities majors, uh, people with strong logic backgrounds, uh, ex-cops, ex-military. Um, you know, I think that we, when I'm looking at talent, it's kind of a running joke. It, it, and I tell people, I look for two things. I look for people who are smarter than me, and I look for people that aren't sociopaths. Uh, and that always gets a little bit of a chuckle, right? But it's, it's when you have people that have to work so closely with each other under high stress, sometimes long hours, off hours, I want people who care about people working for me. Um, and so, you know, everything else can be taught. Um, we can teach you the technology. And, and frankly, the, the technology you're probably learning in a, in a specific degree program is going to be outdated very quickly because of the, just the pace that technology moves. So I think we have to be looking to mentor people to bring in, you know, people and, and build up their skills rather than expecting someone to walk in the door first year and know everything there is to know about security. Just, just all those things super relevant. You hit on something early on there just around, you know, uh, you always kind of view NIT, uh, info, info security, information security, always being a, an offshoot of that, right? We view uh, many, many technologists in that role and, and coming out of other IT traditional backgrounds and not really having the, the kind of the business savvy uh, that uh, it is needed really to be successful these days. And, and so seeing folks, uh, you know, in the CISO roles and in the leadership roles in IT, getting more connected with, with what's going on with the business is just like uh, a necessity, right? I mean, it's just, you know, we have to move in that direction that will drive, uh, you know, no longer just kind of IT separately, kind of figuring out what the business needs and budgeting for those things. And, you know, the budget isn't going to be enough uh, to, to, to deal with the threats to the business, or maybe it could be too much. You know, we just don't know. We're just throwing the yeah. arts out there. So they really have to understand what the risks, uh, uh, what risks it, is the business facing, and then really, you know, drive some of those other things that you talked about, the, the people that, uh, that are going to be needed to support whatever it is that we're trying to accomplish there, and then, you know, uh, other aspects of that as well, you know, technology, but just also also the processes that we're going to be needed to, uh, to be, be defined there. Um, so I think that's a key one, right? Uh, really, and it's 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 not only in information security, uh, it's also just in IT leadership in, in general is really just becoming their neighbor to the business. It's been something that we've all been talking about for probably 10 plus years now. But still, right. Yeah, but still, you know, improvement would need to be made there. And, uh, uh, the, you know, IT leadership and really just the IT workforce having more of that understanding of the business, maybe doing some cross-functional type of awareness uh, so they can see how the business actually works day in and day out and then leverage their expertise with technology, you know, bring that to the game and actually, actually, uh, you know, uh, change the game. For sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think that's exactly right. And, and if you look at the, uh, you know, the history of information security as an offshoot of, of information technology. Um, and, and one one interesting way, I think, to look at that is if you look at where whoever the, 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 the top hat is in your information security organization, if you have a CISO or a CSO or, or maybe you have a director or whatever, where they report up to, I think, is an indication of, of where the industry is moving. So early on, it was always uh, pretty much always the head of security reported to the head of IT. Um, now you're seeing a shift uh, and we've kind of been watching this happen over the last few years where 
uh, security may report to legal. It may report to your chief financial officer. Sometimes the CISO reports directly to the CEO or in the trend, which I think is actually the right the right place to end up is the CISO reports directly to the board of directors. Um, you know, and I think what's happening is that businesses are recognizing that information security is not a technology problem. It is a business problem. The flip side of that is security leaders have long complained that they didn't have a seat at the table. They weren't involved in decision making, you know, um, and I think a large part of that is our own fault as security leaders. We didn't speak the language of the business. We expected them to come to us rather than us meeting them where they are speaking in terms that they understand and they use. Um, so, you know, talking about risk as a business problem is the right way to to advance the conversation, understanding that, uh, as you said, right, resources are always going to be an issue. And you, what you want to do is you want to spend the appropriate amount to mitigate risk to a level that the business is comfortable with. So ultimately, my role is to help the business make well-informed risk-based decisions. None of this stuff is personal. You know, so many security people get bent out of shape when they, they, they tell the business what they think should happen. And the business says, yeah, we get that, but we're not going to do it. That is a business decision. And if I've done my job properly, I've made the best case I can, the business can still choose not to do the thing that I think they should do. That doesn't mean I'm wrong. It doesn't mean they're wrong. It means we've made a decision. And that means we've chosen to accept risk. We've chosen to mitigate risk, whatever. But we're going forward. So we could spend... Um, it, well, and also there's no guarantees, right? This is one of the reasons I think why information security struggles at the financial aspect is we're not like an insurance policy. You know, if, if you live your entire life and your house never burns down, does that mean you wasted money on your homeowner's insurance? Well, no, because you were mitigating risk. The fact that that risk was never realized doesn't matter. Uh, on the same token, we could spend... Uh, you know, all of our company's budget on information security and still suffer a breach through through really no fault of our own. And and so um, I think that security professionals, IT professionals have to understand we serve to support the business, to drive business outcomes and and to help mitigate risk. So um, I think that's kind of turning the model on its head a little bit closer to where it needs to be. We have to be an enabler for the business. That's how you get a seat at the table. Yeah, I like what you said earlier, just around just uh, having, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, having a seat at the table, having recommendations, but at the end of the day, collectively, the decisions made, but the decision is made with a whole lot better data than has typically been there before, uh, where maybe the business leaders are making the decision without a good understanding of what's 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 completely doable there, uh, leveraging technology, right? So bringing that to the table, having that data uh, available to everybody, understanding the benefits, the drawbacks, pros, cons, all that, everybody can make a decision. But once that decision's made, even though it may not be the one that came, that we're, we're recommending, uh, uh, we all line up and we go, right? And, and, uh, and we make the best decision for the organization based on the wrong factors. So, uh, I really like that. I mean, a lot of that's been been missing where decisions are made one way or the other, and it's just a miss, and, and those misses show up at bad times <laughs> uh, when you don't want to show Well, up. right. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I think that point, I, and I really, I want to double down on your point there, because I think that, that key aspect of having data, uh, having metrics that matter, is critical and so many places get this wrong uh if you know you look at at uh slide decks or dashboards or whatever and you have this big funnel that says like oh we had 13 billion log events that translated into you know 1200 incidents which translated like what are those numbers driving how are they helping you improve how are they helping you make an argument that you need more funding or you need more people or the business should really focus on this aspect over here metrics that matter like i i really push my leadership uh you know in my my groups if you're showing me a number that's that's awesome i'm glad you're measuring something like we need to be measuring but we we, we shouldn't just be measuring the things we do because that's just measuring activity i want to find ways to measure outcomes that's how you drive to a place 
that everybody has agreed upon, yeah, right? Yeah. And so, like, I don't care that you worked 1,300 tickets. I mean, I do, right? Yeah. Because that probably means that you're going to burn out. I care about that bit. But yeah. what what outcome are we driving towards and, and how close are we? And how does this help us make better decisions in the future? So that, that kind of fact-based engineering should be at the start of every time we, you know, we deliver a new line of service to the business. Yeah. We need to be thinking about that. How are we measuring it? How, how are we measuring it in a way that the business cares about the outcome yeah. and they can see transparently whether we're delivering that service well or not? Yeah, that makes sense. You know, all the sense in the world. I mean, as far as just having the, having the, uh, the, the metrics there, the, the ability to not just show that you're busy and active and here's why you're spending this amount of money on us, but what, what are you doing to, to change the game and, and uh, really you know, produce better outcomes for the business, right? Uh, and and the, those types of metrics are resonated really across the organization. Everybody can get fired up about that. You know, and everybody knows that you're busy because you're producing some pretty badass stuff. <laughs> you know, some pretty, pretty good uh, uh, outcomes, right? Uh, let's let's uh, kind of let's move to the topic of people. Um, you know, yeah. Obviously, just a, a, a huge issue uh, specifically around you know. The, Security resourcing, uh, building teams, uh, having the right backgrounds. Uh, you know, obviously, really across all all really you know disciplines, uh, having an issue there. You hear, hear talk about the great resignation where folks folks are just bailing out and and finding uh, you know less stressful things to do in these times. Uh, you know, retiring early, all kinds of different things there, but uh, that just makes the uh, the issue that really, you know, information security has been facing for quite some time, even that much more difficult to address. But, but, but let's talk about that a little bit. But there's some insights there. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think it. it, it... <laughs> it, this has been the topic uh, for me, my team, my leadership. Um, you know, over the last couple quarters, at least. Uh, and as I mentioned, you know, there's 800, 850,000 open positions in the U.S. Uh, the, it's estimated there's 3.5 million open infosec positions globally. I mean, it's a staggering number, right? And, um, you know, how do we get out of that problem? How do we, how do we make sure that we have the people who have the skills to be tomorrow's infosec professional, tomorrow's infosec leader? Um, the great resignation has really, or, or I, I prefer calling it the great upgrade. Uh, because I think what what people did is they realize that you know the, the the balance of power has definitely shifted from the corporate side to the the employer the employees side, and people are able to take to look at their life and look at the things that that make them happy. Maybe it's working from home, right? Maybe it's the ability to flex their schedule. Um, you know, there's who knows, but but the the point is that 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 power balance has allowed those people to say, you know what. Um, I love what I do, but I don't like how I do it. I'm going to go find a place where I can work so I can I can do what I do the way that makes me happy, uh, that is more fulfilling to me. Um, the way we've approached this is um, we've gotten very aggressive at recruiting young talent. And I, and I don't mean young necessarily in age, um, although sometimes that's true. I mean young in career. So people fresh out of college, either a cybersecurity program or not, doesn't matter. Um, experience in, in IT or not, frankly, doesn't matter. Um, but also people who are second or third career looking to make a switch. Some of the most effective professionals that I have uh, on my team are people that are second career, ex-military, ex-police, um, I have, you know, ex ex nursing students. I mean, so what we're looking for is future potential. We're looking for intellect and hunger and desire to learn, um, and 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 the right mindset. Um, you know, we have to be very cognizant of the way we are recruiting talent because, like I mentioned earlier, we tend to gatekeep, and that can be things like. Uh, you know, people that hire people that look like them or went to the schools they went to. I want the, the biggest diversity of experience and background I can get, because when you're building a team, you want diversity of thought to help solve tough problems. If everybody looks at a problem the way I look at it, we're going to get an outcome that looks like it's me trying to solve the problem rather than, 
you know, a, a background experience that helps inform that decision making. Um, we have a new program at, at H&R Block called Accelerate, and it is a, a process that we go through twice a year where we take a cohort of associates and we move them through that mentorship process together. So they kind of they've got built in buddies. Um, it gives them exposure to various areas of IT. And at the end, you know, they have a, a path there to become an associate. Uh, software engineer, associate security engineer, things like that, and join Block is you know full salaried, um, full benefit, you know full employee. Uh, we build that over over a, a period of of weeks and months. Uh, so this was our our inaugural year. I have four um, four members from that first cohort on my team, uh, and they're killing it, um, and they're engaged, and they're they're actually making the people around them better. Right, having this fresh energy and these new ideas is uh, a powerful way to to really kickstart that 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 sort of a program building. You know, we talk a lot in in IT about you know it's all about people, process, and technology. We say people first in that triad on purpose. People are the most important part, and if you're not treating your people like the most important part, you've missed the boat. I, I was having a conversation last night with someone uh, who had just come over to our team. She'd been at a, uh, you know, a, a large corporate entity for 10 plus years. Um, and she said they would say to us that people were the most important thing, but then they would also say anybody's replaceable, right? So it's one thing to, you have to, you have to talk the talk and walk the walk. If your people are the most important thing, that means as a leader, you need to be spending a lot of time with your people, helping them, mentoring them, making sure they have what they need so that they can do the things you need them to do and learn and grow. Um, and, you know, as you, you mentioned earlier, like resources are always an issue, whether it's the budget of, of your program or whether it's the fact that you know, it's very difficult to get senior talent right now because of this this talent shortage that we've talked about. So, you know, getting people that can help drive so technology solutions to help fill some of those gaps is pretty important. I love hiring people with development backgrounds, um, be, even if they have no cybersecurity experience, because the real force multiplier for us now is automation. Uh, it's finding ways to take the menial tasks that we that we all do, automate those things, so that we can apply our brain power to the hard problems. Yeah, no, I mean, I think, and also just to the point of like a software developer, you know, they're, they're logical thinkers, right? You know, they're solving problems; they can they can really understand. Uh, there's some different perspectives to it too, so that makes makes absolute sense just to be able to talk around that. I mean, for us here at Robius, you know, from a a culture perspective, there's not only the, the aspect of attracting talent, but it's also retaining. And, and uh, our philosophy at Robis, you hit on it, is if you bring in, you know, you know if your people are happy, uh, then your customers are going to be happy. Ultimately, your, customer, your company is going to be successful. Obviously, you've got to execute, but it starts yeah. with the people. You've got to have an environment that they're happy in. And not only, you know, uh, what I think it's, it's hard about that. Sure, let's just go get a bunch of senior guys and, and bring them in, and we're going to differentiate that way. But uh, you can't, you know, afford a, a full team of senior guys. You know, there's got to be some some way to kind of build build the talent, right? And to your point, the um, the, the program that you that you talked about there is in our block, and uh, what we've worked towards at, at Mobius is to bring in some of that early on talent, maybe talent coming from completely different backgrounds, to give you that diverse thinking and, uh, uh, you know, give them a roadmap to success. But then once you got them there, uh, they have options. So how do you retain them at that point? You know, you got to make sure that you've got right. the right ecosystem, the right culture, you know, the benefits are there, the comp is there. There's so many things that go into retaining, you know, Good, good folks, and, and and a lot of it, I think there's all those things I just talked about, but a lot of it is just um, the, 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 the the atmosphere that they're in, that they want to work with the people that they're working with, you know, and, and uh, they want everybody to be successful around them, and that's something that every individual within a uh, company has to contribute to that, you know, and uh, they're very, very hard to do. Uh, as you as you grow, uh, no question. But I like what you you, you talked about there, just kind of that that incubation to start 
producing talent internally is really good. And, and uh, you know, it doesn't probably fail a few times, right? <laughs> Just figuring it out, but you also uh, uh, get, get better and better along the way. So I uh, appreciate that. I mean, other things we haven't really talked about around keeping uh, people, you know, it's just everything's gone to more of a flexible work schedule, people working at home, you know, and now companies thinking, hey, maybe you know, we can get folks back in the office, and then we have another outbreak or whatever. There's just so many things to consider. And, you know, you find that even with companies that have that physical office space, you really do need folks in there to really perform at the highest level for, you know, for their own for, for their own reasons. You find them really just retaining the, the office space, even though they're nobody in it, they don't need as big of a you know, physical space anymore. They're retaining it just in case they do come back and, you know, maybe dealing with some uh, social distancing, that type of thing, right? I mean, just so many things that go into uh, the decision-making process of people uh, have options on where they're going to work. So you got to be thinking outside of the box, yeah. and, you know, making it an environment that can attract the most talent. You know, absolutely. And, you know, I'll, I'll so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about about what we're doing right now in that space. Um, you know, half of my team is um, domestic and the other half uh, operates out of our technology center in India. Um, so we've been working remote, you know, in a sense for quite a while. And over the last couple of years, we haven't we haven't skipped a beat. Um, the company just made the decision on on the corporate side that, you know, we want people to be together. There's value there, um, but we're not going to force that. We, I want to build a culture now, a new culture where people want to be together. Um, they have a reason to come in and it's not because we are making you do it. We're, you're coming in because you want to come in. Um, I just had, I brought my whole remote team in for the last three days this week. Uh, and when I entered the, walked into the room, the conference room, uh, you know, earlier this week, I realized that about half the team I hadn't ever met face to face, um, which was a, a really weird feeling, but it was a really emotionally powerful moment. Um, there's a stickiness that develops uh, when you have a positive culture and people are physically together. And so we have to figure out how do we how do we build a culture that is now relevant in this new work from anywhere model um, that makes people, you know, care about their coworkers care about what they're doing. And I think the real key there is we have to, as, as, as leaders, we have to help people understand the why uh, they, they need to understand why what they're doing is important, how it connects to business outcomes, how it connects to good security outcomes and understand that what each of them do is important. I don't care how they do what they do and I will help lead them to the what, right? Cause we all develop that framework and that strategy together but the why is the key part. And that's the part that so many leaders skip over. And I think that's why it's part of the reason that people are so willing to, to leave and go somewhere else. They don't feel that connectedness uh, to purpose. Um, but at the same time, like I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a realist about this. I, I know that there are going to be career opportunities out there for some people that are going to be better than what I can offer them at, at a given point in their career path. I will never stand in the way of one of my people with who has a better career opportunity somewhere else where I start chafing is where we lose people because of money. That shouldn't be an issue. You know, like, uh, you know, right. I mean, that, that's just the bottom line. Right. Be competitive, but, uh, but, uh, that was a point you're making. I didn't mean to interrupt you there, Joshua. Yeah. 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 No, no, that's, uh, that's, you know, I mean, it's not just the, if somebody's just interested in piles of money, that's a different issue, right? Um, but if if someone loves what they do, loves where they're working, loves their coworkers, feels you know really powerfully about the mission, um, you know, I, it's not that money isn't important because ultimately we're trading work product for money. That's that's the, the relationship, yes. right? In in a for a job. But having feeling connected to the purpose can help blunt some of those other things. So I want to keep my junior talent pipelines just loaded up, just keep bringing in that young talent. And if if they come in and they stay two or three years and then they find something amazing somewhere else, that's a win. Like we ha I'm helping we are helping build that next generation of, of security leaders and talent. So, uh, you know, I want to do that in a manageable way, but. 
I'm not going to to try and chain people to their desks. Like that's not a, a path to success. No, I totally agree. Yeah, that's a uh, great, great, great points being made there. Yeah, definitely. I'm just going to reiterate again that the uh, the junior talent and the you know, like you said, you're not going to be able to keep them all. There will be opportunities that come up. Uh, and generally, it's going to be maybe a growth opportunity for them, maybe move into a leadership role or something like that, where you just don't have the skill to, 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 that uh, can help them there, right? You know, so you're going to have some of that. Um, but to your point, where you know, if uh, you don't want it to be compensation, if they're contributing, they understand why they're producing, and everybody and the people they work with like working with them too, you know, and, and uh, losing someone like that has an impact on everybody else or could depend if it's the right resource that bails, that can really have a, you know, an upsetting uh, uh, situation for folks. So uh, things we get to deal with uh, from a people perspective, but lots of good insights there for sure. Um, you talked about, you know, it, it, it goes down to fundamentals, you know, IT people process and technology. The second piece of that being process, uh, Let's dive into that a little bit. Uh, give, give us some some perspective yeah. on that. Yeah, I I think that um, you know a lot of times there's there's certainly a maturity curve for for any service line that you offer. And in InfoSec, you know, we talked about measuring and and monitoring things that are important. Um, technology is the way you instantiate process and policy. And a lot of people get that backwards, right? I, I mentioned, you know, everybody's looking for the the Flaminator 3000 one U rack unit that they can slam in and turn it on, and, and all the security problems go away, right? That's it's a myth. That doesn't exist. So, you want your processes to be repeatable, and you want them to be effective, and that means you have to iterate. Um, and I, I was talking to a, a colleague of mine at work this week, and he said something that was really I thought was really powerful. He said. Something doesn't have to be wrong for you to make it better. And I love that, right? Uh, so many times it, it becomes this adversarial thing, like I know how to do it better than you do, so let's change that. Let's build a process that's, that, you know, that's, let's change your process. And, and it becomes an us versus them thing, right? And this is how security got its reputation as the place where good ideas go to die. Um, so, you know, looking at having a, a policy foundation that talks about these are the oughts and the shoulds and the shalls. These are the things that we need to do broadly. Then defining the standards to those policies, right? A lot of times InfoSec, especially at the CISO level, like it's, it's I think a little bit more rare for people to come to a CISO position from a governance risk compliance background than it is from an engineering background. I'm not sure why that's the case, um, but you can't, I, I think you will struggle to build an effective security program that's not based on policy. And it's not because when, when you, somebody does something they shouldn't, you can go back and wave a piece of paper at them and say, see, we told you this is the policy and you have to do this thing. The policies are based on lots of stuff, obviously, regulatory space, contractual requirements, legal requirements. But they're also, they also should be built within the context of what the business needs to do and how it operates to be successful. So when you build your process, it needs to be um, repeatable, it needs to be effective, and ultimately, hopefully, it can be automated. Um, one of the things that we've really been looking at over the last few years as Block has made its pivot from, you know, uh, really a legacy technology company into a, uh, a cloud technology company, um, we wanted to be able to remove security from the equation in the sense that we didn't want security to be a roadblock for innovation. We wanted to help drive innovation. Um, so I like to say we, we try to create a safe space for people to try dangerous things. And what that means is we've defined process, standards, et cetera, and we build those via code into the cloud environments so that the developers don't need to worry about they don't have to be security experts. They don't have to go through a 20 page checklist to stand up a new environment. When the new environment is stood up, it's invoked via code and it already has the security controls built into it. And, you know, we Block just launched a, a, a new uh, banking platform called Spruce, uh, you know, in about a, about a 15 month period from conception to execution. And that was made possible because the processes, those controls were automated, baked in from the start, 
And so we didn't have, you know, it wasn't one of those things where like, okay, we're going to launch tomorrow. Let's go run some vulnerability scans and make sure everything's good. Like it was all part of the process. We were there from the beginning. We were in the background enabling that kind of innovation transparently. And that's a really powerful place for a security team to be in. And it, I got to tell you, man, it feels great when you get to that point. Um, and, and it really, it's about discipline. It's about structure. And it's about this idea that we're never going to be as good as we want to be. And I mean that in a positive sense. We always want to be better. We always want to improve. I, you know, when the employee satisfaction survey or the employee engagement survey comes out, Every year you see people saying, man, it's hard to get things done. It's hard. Like I tell my people, I don't want to see that on our survey results, because if you see something that that is hard to get done or hard to accomplish, make it better. Improve that process. Take ownership. Grab onto that and, and make it better because you're not just making it better for you. You're making it better for everyone else that has to go through that process as well. And so that constant idea of, look, we don't need to be 100 percent perfect. We just need to be open to the idea that we can continuously iterate on these processes, on these on these capabilities, um, and that that enables this kind of level of nimbleness and agility to really support the business of where it wants to be. Not you know, it's the old Wayne Gretzky thing, right? About skating to where the puck is going, not where the puck is. Like that's the vision that you have to have, and to have that, you have to know where the business is going, understand why and how the business is getting there, understand what technology needs are, what the process needs are, what the policy needs are, what the regular like. It's it can it can sound overwhelming, but when it becomes part of how you operate, it becomes a natural flow, and I think that's um, you know we're still working on that, but it's it's really cool when you see it when you see it start working and. The teams are able to recognize all the inputs they need and all the all the stakeholders that get the outputs on the other side when the crank starts turning and it just flows through. It's uh it's a really powerful feeling. You hit on something earlier there, Joshua, around policy and it just being uh, you know, in kind of the IT security for a long time, you know, back uh, you know, many years ago, policy it was just what you described uh, uh, at the beginning where you know you can't you can you can't do that. Here's the policy. You know, quit quit doing that. You know, we're, we're almost like you know, kind of big brother with tracking you there. And it was always this: how can I figure out how to you know get around that, right? Uh, but it's more important that the second point to right. that was really, and you hit on this even earlier in our discussion, was the why. Why is that policy in place? And then really more uh, the policy that is defined, not necessarily that you can't uh, log into the system or whatever, but uh, it's there. To, for this business reason, right? Maybe it's a compliance reason or regulation, a regulatory type of thing. But uh, so important, you know, to get those things identified and communicate to uh, to the teams that the, the why behind it. I think that's just just huge from that perspective. And then, you know, really just that automation theme, you know, uh, and really taking that as far as we can, uh, uh, identifying those repeatable processes. You know, don't do, don't do a lot of custom one-off stuff. You know, try to make it. Uh, leverage scale there and all, but not just look at maybe automating the identification of a problem or or uh, you know the triage aspect of it, but also the remediation and ultimately the, the restoring the business. You know, just taking that all away. And many times we can't okay, we figured out the problem. Okay, well let's let's take that one step further and let's fix it and let's fix it. You know, automatically. <laughs> now we know what just happened. Yeah. Yeah. It, you, yeah. So even really better, just right? Taking it to that, uh, looking at it inclusively, right? And, and uh, you know, and, then, and some of that just comes within how, how you're organized. You know, maybe you've got an operations team and, and then you've got tier two and tier three support. So you really have to get everybody kind of collaborating together to, uh, to get the, the best results possible for the business. But I don't know if you had anything to add to that. Well, I know I, I think it's, you're absolutely right, Scott. I, I was thinking about this uh, snarky T-shirt that I, I remember back from, you know, the dot com, early dot com days that said, you know, back off or I'll replace you with a small <laughs> shell script. Um, and, 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 you know, I think the, the key idea around that, around automation and around what it brings to our teams and, and what it brings to, uh, you know, information security as a whole is that if we're hiring people for their brain power and their ability to solve tough problems, I don't want 
90% of their time spent on rote tasks that can be automated. That's I want to free them from that so that they can bring their brain power to bear on the hard issues. Um, automation should should be enhancing what people do and replacing the stuff that they don't enjoy doing. Uh, and that's that helps with the why. It helps drive passion. It drives connectedness to the business and the processes. Um, so you know, I think I think we really are kind of at a nexus now, and we're starting to see the power of some of these you know SOAR technologies and. Um, and things like that, you know, automating all the things, uh, as we say in, in the biz. No, great insights. Another uh, topic I know we could go on, on and on on. Uh, but let's, uh, let's uh, talk about that third pillar, right? Technology. And, and uh, you mentioned, uh, I think we nailed this in the order of importance. Um, but uh, and so, many, so, many, yeah. so many times in the past, you know, we need the technology. That's what we like. It's cool. We, you know, we saw some things that maybe cause a lot causes a lot of manual effort within the IT organizations but may or may not really have much of an impact to the business. Uh, but let's, let's talk about the technology. Sure. Series. Yeah, I mean so technology needs to be the last thing you look at. Um, you know, you technology is the instantiation of policy in in a lot of cases. And we want technology to make things easier for us not harder. Um, that has not been the case. And, you know, frankly, the InfoSec industry from a technology perspective has not done itself any favors. Um, we, you know, we, we motivate people by fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Um, you know, I, I wrote an article not long ago about, about the, the cycle of fear, uncertainty, and sales, right? So, um, you know, with the Ukraine situation right now, not to be too topical, but, you know, they're immediately like CISA and, and DIST and some of those government institutions issue alerts. And then immediately the inbox starts getting flooded with, uh, you know, vendors saying, oh, you know, what are you doing everything you can to protect against Ukraine? Like we're doing everything we can on a daily basis. I don't need to buy uh, a, a Ukraine specific <laughs> product, yeah. you know, to do that. And I, I just I really detest leveraging events to try and scare people into spending money on tools. Don't get me wrong, tools are important. The right yeah. tools are important. Um, but you know, I try to instill this idea that we should always be doing tech rationalization. I would much rather spend money on people than on technology. Um, now you get the right people and that means, you know, you can make different technology decisions. Um, but I think, you know, we all need to be very clear eyed about what technology we need. And, and one of the things my boss says to me a lot, and it's exactly the right question is, right, I, I get why you say we need this. I get what it does. What is the value that it brings to the company, right? And maybe the value is risk mitigation. Maybe the value is optics, right? Uh, I think we're seeing that a lot in the cyber insurance industry right now, buying cyber, cyber risk insurance products. Um, and and the and just the skyrocketing cost of those largely because of ransomware, um, but you know what? Like, the reason people are getting nailed by ransomware is they have bad cyber hygiene, they have bad uh, you know business continuity and disaster recovery practices, um, they have you know bad practices around local admin rights and USB controls and you know on and on and on. Right? There's so many things you can. Yeah. There, exactly. There's so many things you can do that don't cost any money that make you a, a, a you know, a much less appealing target. Um, so all of that said, when a company looks at its cyber in a uh, cybersecurity program, it should be first looking, do I have the right people to do what we need to do? Then do I have the right policy base? on which to build out my capabilities and deliver those to the company. And then, and only then should you look at buying tools. Um, and every tool you buy, you need to be thinking holistically about the environment, right? Stop buying point solutions and think about how it integrates into the larger picture. Um, and, I, and I think, you know, the, the discipline that we need around vendor management, around tool selection, uh, around partners, like don't, you know, invest in your partners don't invest in in specific solutions but too many uh you know the value added resellers they forget the the va part of that value add and they're just pushing paper you should partner with places and organizations that that understand what you're trying to achieve 
and that they are helping you solve problems, not pushing technology yes. on you. Absolutely. I think just the, the one of the things that we look at, I, I kind of go back to early in my career, you know, just to comment or anything else, but working on, uh, on the customer side uh, at uh, what's now Verizon, it's GT here at Dallas, but, but uh, being a technologist then, uh, I had no clue what my job meant or the technology I was administering did for the company. You know, I could do things very well and understood all that, but I had really yeah. no clue. And it wasn't until I kind of moved over to, you know, the vendor world where I understood like this, that there's business value here. And, and, and I understood the business value of that technology and, and uh, kind of put those pieces together. But I don't know that that's as, as much of the case today. I'm sure there's some of that for folks coming in that have the, computer science degrees, right, and, and know technology really well, but still coming up to speed on the business side. And I can't really talk to whether or not my executives at the time knew the business value of it. I'm sure, you know, they probably did. It was just kind of where I was at in my career. But it's just so important to, you know, why are they spending, you know, these dollars uh, to, to go to be able to do that type of stuff? I mean, you hit on something that I think is important, uh, though, as we make technology investments. It's always around that that uh, rationalization of the investments that we have made and, and keeping an eye on innovation in the space, you know, cybersecurity and vulnerability yes. are pretty dynamic. So you want to make sure that you have an eye on you know, innovations, you know, maybe what, uh, where venture capital firms are making investments and see you know see gaps those kind of things i think that's important when you when you're taking a look at the uh, at the technology side of things just to make sure you're aware of what's available to you currently not what was available to you three months ago because things are changing so much yeah absolutely yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, judging by the volume of, of email that I get, I could easily fill every <laughs> single day with vendor meetings. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and I do, like I said, I am a technologist. Um, I, I, I think that a lot of the stuff that's, that's in development and, and, you know, like there's some really cool things out there, really cool tools. Do they drive value for the business? I mean, it depends on your business, depends on, on what you're trying to achieve. Um, but, you know, again, just recognizing the, the pool of resources is finite. Uh, and if you spend money on product A, it means you don't have that money to spend on people or product B or, you know, whatever it is. Um, so you just, you know, CISOs have to be very strategic about this. They need to be talking to their peers across the organization and in, in other verticals and, and really understanding, like, if, if I can solve not just a problem for me, but a problem for one of my peers, a problem for the business, uh, that just builds the reputation of InfoSec as a partner uh, and as someone that deserves to have a seat at the table. So, totally get that. Yeah, great points there. Yeah, I think we're getting to a point kind of wrapping up. You know, one of the things that you know, we talked about a lot here, but one of the things that, uh, uh, you know, in some cases, business leaders, this isn't just a, you know, we make these decisions, we nail down the policies, we get the right teams in place, and we make some technology investments, and then we just execute it. This is just a, a continuous evolution <laughs> that, uh, you know, somewhat of a journey that we're, uh, that we're on. Um, uh, so it doesn't, it's not like we'll do this and then, you know, move on to the next thing. This is something that continuously, you know, I think you said it earlier, just uh, iterating over and over and over again on how to improve things. And something that works today can be improved tomorrow, you know, for various different reasons. But uh, talk a little bit about just the importance of that yep. you know, as we wrap up here. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah, it's, it's a mindset, you know, Scott, it's, it's um, never being satisfied with the status quo. Um, and, you know, we talked about metrics. I think that's really important. Um, yeah. You know, ultimately, you know, let, let's just take instant response, for example, right? Um, you know, you, you typically want to track your, your mean time to detect and you want to track your mean time to remediate. And you want to you want to see what those numbers are looking like on a continuous basis. Maybe you add a new tool, and for a while those numbers are going to get higher, which you don't want, until the tool's fully integrated and people are comfortable with it, and then you start seeing the benefits. Or maybe there's something happening where you're getting uh, more business email compromise attempts, and your your mean time to detect is still good, but your mean time to remediate is going up. That means maybe I need to I need to find a way to automate a process and a response or I need more people or something. Right. 
we need to be using those numbers to make fact-based yeah. engineering decisions. And that's what enables this iteration. If you're not measuring it, I, I really believe if you if you're not measuring it and you can't measure it, I have a hard time believing it actually matters. And so when you focus on that aspect and, and like I said, making things better, not just saying they're wrong, but I found a way to improve them and here's here's how we're going to do it and here are the benefits. That kind of a mindset is what drives, I, I think also helps drive stickiness, right? The attachment to caring about the outcome such that I always want that outcome to be better than it is so right now. This, uh, you know, metrics that you hit on, making sure that we are you know, uh, measuring to the things that are most important. Uh, and then just, we hit, I think we discussed it earlier as well, just that making good data-driven decisions, right? You, know, you have that, that information. Uh, available to you, then, then you can see opportunities to improve and, uh, you know, even issues that may, you know, that may be vulnerabilities that may be there that, uh, that you can close up, you know, prior to maybe somebody uh, exploiting those types of things. But uh, great discussion today, Joshua. I really appreciate it. Um, you know, good, good insights on uh, uh, really just kind of where cybersecurity is and, and uh, some key things that folks can take away. Uh, I'm going to close up the podcast for today, um, but let me do that. Uh, I will uh, summarize a little bit about what we've talked about. You know, make no mistake, folks, uh, us good guys have some work to do. Uh, how do we start winning? Focus on the key pillars of IT, people, process, and technology, specifically in this order. Develop new programs to attract and retain talent. Automate everything you can and apply technology to support the defined business outcomes, policies, and standards you define for your business. Joshua, thanks for spending some time with us today uh, and sharing your thoughts. Yeah. Uh, it's been my pleasure, Scott. Uh, it would be great to have you come back and join me on a future episode and continue to build on you know, what we talked about today. Uh, so we'll hopefully we can make that happen down the road. We hope the information... Now appreciate it. I'd love that. We hope the information shared today provides some takeaways for our listeners on how they can improve their cybersecurity game. I also wanted to thank our listeners for, for your continued support. And please reach out to Mobius Partners. We'd love to engage with you to help you successfully manage your cybersecurity initiatives. Until next time, folks, everyone stay safe out there. All the best.